This is the original Atari ST from the late 1980s. The cheapest official monitor was only black and white, but it did allow cost-conscious people to have a computer at home. On my left-hand side, I have a whole load of budget music gear from the same kind of era. Yet music history rarely remembers the more humble budget synths like these. In fact, when you read about the Atari making music, you'll find photos of the Atari ST sitting on top of mixing desks and people posing with their Ataris surrounded with serious looking equipment. And this is because the Atari ST has built-in MIDI ports. And MIDI was the standard from about 1985 onwards, and almost every single keyboard, synthesizer, sampler had MIDI on the back of it. So that meant this home budget computer could control an entire recording studio. But let's be realistic. If you were a kid in the 1980s with an Atari ST, you probably didn't own a whole recording studio. Instead, you're gonna need one piece of equipment that you can plug into your MIDI ports to start making music. But couldn't the Atari make its own sound? This is the Atari's built-in sound. It's three channels with some pretty clever tricks for drums, but most aspiring musicians wanted more than simple chip tunes. So they would take a trip to their local magazine store and see what knowledge they could find. This special edition of Atari magazine attempts the schoolers on a simple studio setup. A keyboard, a drum machine, and an effects processor. And this assumes that you have a mixer and speakers already. The total cost? Way too much for this kid. Considering the Atari by itself was around 300 pounds, let's set our budget at half of that. Our 1988 wish list would then include an all-in-one keyboard with lots of instant sounds. It needed to be multi-tombral, meaning that it could play multiple sounds at once, and it needed built-in drums. And it's at this point in the video we need to talk about the Korg M1 because the Korg is remembered as probably the best value synth of 1988. But it's remembered by professionals, not teenagers. And in fact, we need to knock a zero off that price if we're gonna be able to afford something. So let's try again. You'd look for a reputable company, say Yamaha, who also released high-end workstations but they also made kids' keyboards, and you'd look for something that fell between these two categories. Behold, the Yamaha Music Station. Tons of instant sounds, a programmable FM synth, digital drums, effects, 12 notes of polyphony, built-in speakers, and full MIDI support. And compared to a studio workstation, this thing was cheap. This model came from the Porter Sound range, and Yamaha were clear who their audience were. Cool kids, beginners, absolute amateurs, and even more kids. Look at that SHS 200, she's living the dream. Meanwhile, Yamaha seemed a little bit reluctant to show us a use case for their highest end Porter Sound, but clearly pointed out MIDI support. Loads of Atari users bought these, especially in the UK, and you'd find heaps of them for sale in the second-hand section of Atari magazines. But why this synth? Well, my theory is because it was in the Argos catalogue, a hugely popular UK discount store. And sure enough, nestled between the calculators and the cots, there's two distinct MIDI keyboards, the Music Station. So there were two music stations that were out at any one time, usually a larger model that had these uh, drum pads on them and a couple of extra percussion sounds. And then there was an extra octave up the top. But apart from that, they're both based around the same Yamaha OPL chip. And because of this, they have the same buttons. They're just different shapes in different places. So we're gonna use the cheaper of the two and I have a microphone set up so that you can hear the wondrous sound I hear through these little speakers. And we're gonna to switch to a line in a bit later on. So, first of all, without a computer attached, what have we got? Well, what about some fill? But if you put the synth into a special slave MIDI mode and you run cables to and from the Atari, you end up with a 16-channel multi-tombral FM synthesizer that responds to all 16 channels and has the drums as well on channel 16. So what we're going to do now is 
go to our, whoops, our Atari, we'll leave that in, and we're gonna use a program called Dr. T's MIDI Recording Studio for Atari ST. Now this is gonna be quite a treat. And this was one of the cheapest packages of 1988. So Music Technology Magazine says it's okay, and Dr. T also made a bunch of other more expensive software for lots of platforms, so we're gonna hope that it's okay. Just remember that the hardware sequences of the day were very much about step sequencing note by note. So we're gonna expect that this will be quite similar. So, ooh, we've loaded, let's have a look. And you can see we've got our eight empty tracks here and a standard media player down below. We press F1 and then we choose to clear all tracks. And then that lets us choose a length. So we're gonna choose 256 as our length. That's about two minutes. And that's our setup ready to go. So back on the Yamaha keyboard, we've got a sound that's a little bit like an oboe. And what we're gonna do is modify that sound. And you can see there's a little block diagram here that shows how it works and six buttons that we use to program it. We can then jump into our frequency. We can choose our... Sounds pretty cool. And we can then put our mod level up, which will make it a bit dirty until it goes into white noise. That sounds pretty good. So let's hit record in MCS and then we'll play along. Here we go. And we can see the event list now and we can replay. So there's obviously a rogue note there. We can delete that one and we can also tighten up our timing. So that will now give us a nice tight version of it. Let's add some drums to that. So we'll go to the next track. And this time we're gonna overdub. So I like how our drums are sounding, but the snare could do with an extra layer because I've got this bell sound. And what we're gonna do is push that up so that it has a faster decay rate. You actually about right then we go to our mod level and we're going to push that up till it hits noise there we go so that's the noise by itself and you add the drums back in that's our beat and what we can do at this point is merge our drums and we're going to end up with all of those in a single track together so we get a track back now we just need to add some bass Well, that was a bit of a marathon, so uh, I'm gonna plug you in now so that you can hear from a line source what this sounds like. And I'm gonna go through each of the eight tracks that I've created so you can hear all the parts and then we'll hear them all together. And finally, all together. And I think it's gonna be montage time. While this boppy disco tune plays, let's explore the Atari monitor. The ST had a split personality. It wanted to compete with gaming systems so it could plug into your existing television. But for complex interfaces, this was too low res and flickery. So Atari developed their own cheap mono monitor. The image here is 640 by 400 in glorious one bit. And while it's not brilliant for photos, it did provide a crisp interface for detailed desktop work. Meanwhile, 
we're pushing the music station to its limit and you'll notice the display flashing full channels. This is telling us that the synths run out of notes and we're literally right on the limit of what we can do with the music station here. Casio also offered various budget synths and they were hugely popular in the US market. However, these lack the FM synth and 16 channel support. So, especially in Europe, the Yamaha reigns supreme. Well, I gotta say that was pretty intense using MIDI Recording Studio. So we're gonna hide this under here and hopefully never speak of it again. I do have to mention that the later Dr. T software was much better. We've been using a very early version. And a bigger limitation is the sound. The Yamaha sound has got a very arcade sound and that's not surprising because it has a similar chipset to those which were in arcades. But let's say we wanted a more produced sound. Was this something that we could upgrade just our sounds with? Welcome to the world of MIDI sound modules. Mostly in rack form factor for the gigging musician and studios and mostly priced well over a thousand dollars. But there was a small legendary box that price undercut them all. The Roland MT32. The MT32 was a budget module which used Roland's LA Synthesis engine, an audio processor found in much pricier Roland gear. This little wonder had 128 preset sounds, drum kits and a reverb processor. It became so popular among game composers that Sierra Online began listing it as the recommended music device on their game boxes. But its original intention was for the home musician on a budget. So in this box, I actually have the MT100, which is very similar to the MT32, but it just has this proprietary disk drive that records in its own format, and that's just for recording live performance. It was actually designed to sit on top of a digital piano. And in fact, if you went to music stores, they'd often have one of these sitting on top of a digital piano, and you could walk in and turn it on and have a play. So the default sound, of course, was the slap bass. And if you turn this little knob on the top, you can select a bunch of other sounds. There is a reverb setting you can dial in. And this actually adds a lot of atmospherics to any sound you play. So back on the Atari, we've now upgraded to Steinberg Cubase version one, and this is actually 1.5, which is the earliest version I could find. And you can see Carl Steinberg in the credits. He was a pretty good uh, German keyboard player, most notably in Krautrock band the Turner Steer Crew, but he was also a passionate audio engineer. And together with a few other people, Steinberg had created Pro 16 for the Commodore 64, then Pro 24 for the Atari. So by the time Cubase rolled around, there was a fair bit of hype. And Sound on Sound magazine gave it a five page review, which is pretty impressive for a software package. Okay, let's have a look at Cubase and we can start off by having an empty project here and just pressing Control and T 10 times and we end up with 10 tracks. Tracks two to nine being instruments that were play out of the MT32 and channel 10 being the drums. So here we have our setup with our music station running into our Atari running into the MT100. And what that means is that we can play on the Yamaha and there is sounds being generated, but we've got the volume down on the Yamaha. And if we go to track number two, you'll hear, these are the presets basically on the 10 channels. Let's have a listen. Love that sound. I think that's from the D50. And finally, the drums. 
If you want to start changing the sounds, you can start dialing them up in over here, or you can actually dial them in from the keyboard. So we've got this very useful sound list that comes with the MT32 on 100. If we dial in, say, 61, if we dial in 44, we also have a sustain button and a vibrato button. And if we wish to change the volume, we have a volume button. And this to me is a great example of MIDI working well. We can control a whole load of things from the music station on the MT100, but the Atari is also able to capture everything that we do on the music station as well. Talking of the Atari, let's record some tracks and see what they look like. To do that, we're going to grab the piano and we're going to go Control and P, which will give us a part. So if I press record, all right, that's very simple, but you get the idea. If we jump into this and we go to edit keys, you can now see that this is our keys. And if we press play, aha. And we can go in and fix that note there, and that note there, and that note there, which are my fingers slipping on the little keys. Sounds perfect. All right, let's record some drums. You can see our timing is a little bit out on some of the drums, so we can just bring that in with quantize. Of course, I can now just add manual things like crashes, maybe a couple of claps, fix the fill at the end. And if I want to repeat this drum beat, I can create ghost copies of it, which will reference the first copy. Now, if you've used modern software, a lot of this is going to feel very familiar. If we look in the edit menus, everything is as we would expect, complete with the view modes we looked at before. And if I open a song I created earlier, this one's called YouTube.R, you can see that we have a timeline of parts. We have our track names on the left, we have our channels in the middle, and on the bottom, some credits, which is commonplace to put them there in the old days. And if we double click on a part, we can tweak parameters. And at the start of each track, we have our program changes, which sets our instrument, our volume, our panning, and so you would typically leave the first few bars blank so that programming can occur. So when we press play, we're going to wait a few bars, and then... And the bass notes missing at the end. Uh, and that's the thing with the MT32. It's a great step up in quality, but you had to be very careful when picking instruments. For instance, Piano 1, which we're listening to at the moment, takes four of the 32 voices per note. So if you play eight notes in a row, the earlier note, which is the lower note here, will cut off. Let's have a listen. There it goes. So if your tune had lots of parts, you'd have to choose lower quality sounds or your notes would simply cut out. And in fact, the sound list that comes with the MT32 lists how complicated the sounds are. So you could pick simpler versions of the sound if you ran into trouble with notes cutting out. Now talking of limitations, we also have this music station. We've got the volume down and we're just using it as a controller now. Keys are tiny, there's no touch sensitivity. And while it was good fun having the bigger controller hooked up to the Roland, unfortunately a big digital piano would cost more than this entire setup. So it does make you wonder if there was something else out there that combined a good digital synth and a reasonable key bed. In 1988, Kawai released the iconic K1M. They even advertised in Atari magazines like Start 
Although strangely, they ran their first ad in the Atari ST Business Special, alongside in-depth comparison reviews of spreadsheets and databases. Hmm. But you couldn't miss the double-page ad on page 88. Not only was the Kawai cheaper than the Roland, but it could also save custom sounds, and for 50% more, you could get a keyboard with full aftertouch. And here it is, the full keyboard version of the K1, complete with touch-sensitive keyboard. You can see it's got multiple memory banks and you can also control the synth. And it has this crazy little joystick for blending between sounds. It has a memory expansion and a power switch. Let's go. <laughs> And this digital kind of breathy sound is what they were trying to showcase. These were traditionally very expensive sounds. So to get a sound like this under a thousand dollars was kind of amazing, but it still had awesome digital basses. A Miami. An electric piano. It's very different to the Roland, but then we have this. It's kind of beautiful, huh? And you can hear the pitched crashes are great because you can make them sound different. And in fact, you can pitch everything. So you can really tune those drums. Now there are eight parts that you can assign to eight MIDI channels. And we're gonna make a track here and I'll show you what the instruments are. We're gonna start with the drums. And I've used zoning here to make sure all the drums are in good positions on the keyboard. A bass. Brass. Then we have this weird panpipe thing. And finally, a super chill synth. Let's plug this into the Atari. And the first thing that you'll notice is that it takes up a lot more desk space. And this is to be expected because, you know, it's a bigger key bed, but it's actually quite good. You know, you just sort of angle it up and get your speakers in a good position and you're right to go. Now, if I just play it, it sounds like nonsense because it's playing every single layer at once. But on the Atari, we can actually break this down into individual tracks and work on one part at a time. And in fact, this is what I've done here and I've made a little track to demonstrate the K1 to you. So enjoy. I love how the Kawai K1 sounds completely different to the Roland. So what I'm gonna do is put a little cassette in the old tape deck, and with this little homemade mixer, I'm gonna dub in some guitar over the top.
And there we go, that is our demo tape. And what we could do now is gift this to someone and say, well, that's our idea. Uh, what do you think? And I've used this little homemade mixer to mix the synth and guitar together. Now there's one small issue with all of the synths we've looked at today, and that's that they're missing one very important sound, and that was a realistic acoustic piano. Sounds okay, but it's clearly electronic. So in 1988, Yamaha quietly released this cheap, realistic sounding piano module. And I'll make a whole video about why this thing exists, but Sound on Sound magazine claimed that it could be the bargain of the year, so I've got high hopes. Let's hook it up. What we're gonna do is daisy chain it via the MIDI through of the MT32, and over on the Atari side, the top track is our piano module, and everything underneath is our MT32. Let's hear how it sounds. That sounded pretty good to me, and it's because the Yamaha is doing all of the heavy lifting on the piano. So we can use the higher quality sounds on the Roland, which use more voices per note. Now from here, you could get things like drum machines and effects, but then you'd need a mixer, and it'd start to get expensive again. But this is in fact what Yamaha did, and in fact they offered all of the modules as separate units, complete with a mounting kit to secure your tower. But for less, you could buy a Roland or a Kawai which combined all of these into one unit. Ah, and then there's the Casio. But the music station to my ears probably has the same amount of capability. Now you might ask, what about the used market? Could I have just bought a secondhand synth? Well, not really, because multi-tombral synths had only been around for a few years, especially the ones with MIDI, when these cut price instruments came out. They also cost a lot more money and they featured multiple outputs, had better keybeds, more buttons, and generally had better build quality, so they held their value. Of course, General MIDI arrived four years later and changed everything, but these were the types of budget offerings in the late 1980s that combined the Studio Basics into a single box for the first time. Regarding the price of Cubase, let's just say there were ways of obtaining copies that would get you started if you didn't mind the occasional bug. But the serious users would go on to buy boxed copies, which came with a full dongle, which had extra MIDI outputs and a built-in synchronizer. And this would allow you to sync up with a tape machine or compose for film and TV, at which point you may have even been able to afford a hard disk. Or you could even score for an orchestra using one of Roland's new romplers. And if you dug just a little deeper, you may have even discovered your MT32 was a little more powerful than you realized. And that's why we've got a part number two. So as usual, share your own stories in the comments. A big thanks to Musines and Archive.org. I donate to both and they are such a source of information for these videos. Finally, to everyone who helped repair the broken synthesizers and Ataris that I had to fix to make this video. And last but not least, all of the viewers and people who have left comments in the past and inspired me to start making videos again. So we're back and I'll see you soon in part two.